This video is sponsored by TrueFire. Over 2 million guitar players worldwide improve their playing using TrueFire's online lesson systems. Learn, practice, and play with TrueFire. Hi, this is Keith Williams. Welcome to 5 Wire World, where we're interested in helping you get the most music from the least gear. Ken Fisher built fewer than 100 train wreck amps in the two decades he was building his own designs. Recently, I was talking with Holger Notzel from Comet Amps, and he pointed out that unlike all the other brands of early boutique amps, you can't point to a specific recording that is the recording of a train wreck. A Dumble? Robin Ford's Talk to Your Daughter? Mesa Boogie? Carlos Santana's Moonflower? Soldano? Pretty much any Warren Haynes live recording. And Matchless? Well, in the early 90s, it was hard to find a major act that wasn't using a Matchless. But there isn't a specific record where you can hear the sound of a train wreck. Between the incredible rarity of the amps and the lack of a definitive recording, you're left with myth and magic, rumors and riddles, or maybe expense versus experience. So this is going to be a much more auditory short history, with more playing time than is typical. And as Jeff Mackerlane is doing the playing, I'm supremely confident that it'll work out, and we'll all be better for it, because this is the 5 Watt World short history of train wreck amps. If you enjoy our videos, take a minute to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified when we put out new videos. And if you've already subscribed, swing by the store and grab a t-shirt or a hat to support what we're doing here. And by request, I've added a tip jar as well. And if you don't need another hoodie, but want to become a bigger part of 5 Watt World, think about becoming a member of the Friends of 5 Watt. The links are in the description. Ken Fisher's story is a familiar one, similar to many other small boutique builders of amps or pedals. He was a tinkerer since childhood, you know, the sort of kid that took things apart to see how they worked. He went on to be an RCA-trained electrical engineer, a Navy aviation and anti-submarine technician, and after the service, he worked as a TV repairman when TVs still had tubes in them. He went on to work at Ampeg in the 70s, and at first building amps and then designing them. When Ampeg was sold in 1980, he left, not wanting to work for a company that was no longer being run by musicians. An interesting statement in the context of the present day world where many instrument companies are owned by finance firms. So in 1980, Fisher found that his after hours amp repair business would have to become his main source of income, and he did well enough to incorporate in 1982. One of Fisher's early loves was motorcycles, and having a penchant for crashing, his biker buddies gave him the nickname Trainwreck. It stuck, and it became the name of his early repair business, Trainwreck Circuits. Any amp repair guy will tell you that as soon as you hang out your repair shingle, players will start asking you to make modifications. But Fisher wasn't particularly interested in performing the standard mods popular in that era. Instead, he began experimenting, trying to make each amp that he worked on sound as good as it could. He would spend endless hours trying not just different values of parts, but different brands of parts to get the sounds he wanted. This philosophy of constantly looking for ways to improve the amp sound, regardless of what type of circuit it started out as, permeated everything that was done at Trainwreck. And until the end, good enough was never quite good enough for Ken Fisher. Fisher's obsessiveness came with some controversial beliefs when it came to amp design. For example, he would only use an aluminum chassis because he believed that steel would interfere with the magnetic field created by the output transformer and negatively impact the amp's tone. Also, understanding that each part of the amp with current flowing through it was part of an electrical field, he spent a lot of time on part placement, what is referred to as layout in circuit design. Though now more widely accepted, at the time amp designers hadn't spent as much time on the layout as they had on signal flow. People like Dumble and Fisher began to modify the layouts, often moving parts off the circuit board, believing that the parts' electrical characteristics included interacting with each other. Fisher would keep modifying the layout, moving parts and connector wire, all in three dimensions, until he got what he was looking for. Fisher would only use solid core wire because he believed that braided wire caused phasing issues between the input and output signals. This was tied to his belief that the input and output signal the amp should be in phase to optimize the amp's responsiveness, harmonics, and feedback. Though this is a recognized issue, most amp designers believe that it is too small to be concerned with, but nothing was really too small to be of concern to Fisher. For example, throughout the 80s, Fisher bought all his transformers from Stancor. When he would receive a batch of transformers, all built to his spec and ostensibly the same, he would put them in a test rig he'd built, listen to each one, and sort them. Out of a batch of 25, he would deem 10 to be good enough to put into one of his train wreck amps. And among these, he would still note the differences in response, labeling some for more vintage sounds and some for more modern, aggressive circuits. Of course, many builders don't agree with much of what Fisher believed, 
but then few are as obsessed to the extent that Fisher was. Fisher's beliefs were built on experience, and that experience was exhaustive. So his ideas might not be reproducible by others, or frankly, whether what he believed was even true or not. He believed the sound of his amps came from his focus, and the sound of his amps cannot be denied. <laughs> In a very short time, Fisher became so well regarded for his mods that players from around the world began visiting his basement workshop at his home in Colonia, New Jersey. Early clients included Mark Knopfler and Eddie Van Halen. Fisher's first wholly original amp, built for a customer, was for Casper McLeod, who was playing in Beatlemania on Broadway. McLeod was having trouble with his Vox amps being reliable for the multiple shows a day that Broadway schedule demanded, and he asked Fisher to build him something that would stand up to the rigors of performing while capturing that chiming magic of the AC-30. As a proof of concept, Fisher first built an amp with two EL-84 power tubes, and when this surpassed all expectations, he went on to build the full 4 EL-84-3 ECC-83 British Class A sounding amp. Fisher named the amp the Liverpool 30. Despite the name and the four EL-84s, the Liverpool does not share a lot with the internals of an AC-30, but it does generate the chime of an AC-30 in addition to the girth of a Marshall, with a not insubstantial amount of gain on tap. Word on the street about the Liverpool spread so quickly that Fisher found himself inundated with orders for Liverpools at a time when his amp repair business was still much more profitable than his amp building business. Because he believed that people would never remember a serial number, and that each amp was unique, he gave them names instead of serial numbers. That first amp was named Ginger, after McLeod's wife. Fisher also believed that each amp was unique, as unique as a person, with a specific personality. He would even change the sort of music he was playing in the shop while working on the amp, believing that the immersion in a musical environment would help guide him to do the right things with the amp design. But building Liverpools had pulled Fisher away from the project he'd been consumed with, designing the Trainwreck Express. In fact, the earliest Liverpools were called Trainwreck Express Liverpools. But by 1984, he was ready to release his Express. This design came from an ongoing relationship with a client always asking for mods to his marshals. But it would be very misleading to say it was a modded marshal. Tasked with nailing Eddie Van Halen's tone, he started with a 100-watt design. First, Fisher radically increased the gain in the preamp, but this left the amp too loud for practical use. So Fisher moved to using two EL-34s instead of the original four to bring the overall volume level more into line with the needs of the players at the time. And with a unique preamp and power section, the Express had become a wholly new thing. The runaway success of the Express merely added to the hype that had already built around the Liverpool among those in the know, still living in a mostly pre-internet world. And as word of the Express got around, Fisher decided to dedicate all of his time to building and servicing only his own designs. The prices of these early amps started at around $650 and rose over time to around $1,800 with a very few selling in the low $3,000 range late in Fisher's life. But the scarcity of the amps in the used market drove prices into double or triple that. Of course, Fisher did not profit from this aftermarket reality, and yet he decided to keep his own prices the same. It was a player-friendly, but not very profitable, business model. Sadly, just as Fisher's fame began to balloon, he began wrestling with health problems that eventually led to a diagnosis of chronic fatigue immune dysfunction syndrome. When he was feeling well enough, he'd work on an amp for one of the people that was on the ever-growing waiting list. But he never stopped thinking about new designs. And around 1990, he began working on the Rocket. Its roots were in a tweaked AC-30 with three ECC-83s and four EL-84s in the power section. This amp too became yet a third source of demand for his original designs. 
The Rocket was built as a cleaner platform, rooted more in the vintage sounds of a Vox and Marshall, but with an absolute devotion to circuit minimalism, and was less hostile towards effects and pedals, which is an exceptional thing in the train wreck universe. At the core of Fisher's designs is a precarious balance between the gain overdrive distortion generated by the preamp and the power amp working in concert. It was this balancing act between pre and power stages that seemed magical to Fisher. He said, when you start getting complex harmonics, that's what you need to make an amp sound complex. The more stable the amp becomes, the less complex it is. Train wrecks were designed to be turned way up, and then you would control the amount of overdrive and accompanying volume from the volume knob on your guitar. Of course, this is how everyone had to handle volume and distortion prior to the advent of master volume circuits, but the difference in responsiveness between a cranked Fender or Marshall and a train wreck is immense with even those amazing vintage amps being far more compressed in their highs and lows. The good news is that even before the amps begin to break up, the train wreck amps have complex harmonics that yield incredible clean tones. When pushed past noon, the amps won't get any louder, but they do get dirtier, compress and sustain longer. In crunch territory, the rich harmonics pile up as you allow notes to sustain. And all of this tone is attached to an amp that by design has famous dynamics and touch sensitivity. The amount of distortion you might get can certainly be controlled by the volume knob, but more relevant is the range of grit you can get right from your pick at any given volume. Fisher's designs have a very fast response along with harmonic richness and dynamics. For some players, train wrecks can be pretty unforgiving. It will generate all those harmonics for every note, whether you intended that note or not. Your right hand is going to be very directly connected to the amp. There isn't anywhere to hide playing a train wreck. Working out of his basement, Fisher had a very small group of friends and associates, but within this group, it was common for him to talk to them nearly every day on the telephone. One of these people was his friend John Mark, or JM, the man that now builds train wreck amps in association with Fisher's family. John generously spent a couple of hours on the phone with me sharing his memories of his great friend. Late in 1979, as a guitarist, John was caught up in the fusion playing at that time. Al Demiola and John McLaughlin were his heroes, and he worked hard at developing that speed in his own playing. His deep friendship started when Fisher asked John to play one of the amps while Fisher tweaked things. They turned it up, and John blazed away, and the amp just couldn't keep up with the barrage of notes. Ken burst out laughing, delighted at the amp's shortcomings being laid bare. But Ken was the sort of person who would welcome that kind of challenge. From that moment on, JM was one of Ken's preferred amp testers for the next 25 years, right up until Ken's passing. John would spend years sitting with Ken in the shop, testing and listening along with Ken to all of the new designs. Having his own background in electronics, after Fisher passed, the family asked if John would consider building some of Fisher's designs. And so it is John Mark that builds branded train wreck amps at present. The link to their website is in the description. But long before Fisher passed away in 2006, the price of the few chain wreck amps out in the world had skyrocketed. His list of amp orders had grown to seven pages long. He never took any deposits, and even as his health continued to fail, the list continued to grow. JM told me that Fisher would not give in to the pressure of celebrity. Your place on the list was your place on the list, and he was well known for being more interested in building an amp for a great player than someone with deep pockets. I called Carter Vintage in Nashville to get some sense of the current prices for an original train wreck amp. The last time they sold one, between 2015 and 2016, it sold for $40,000. So they were confident in quoting that an amp in good condition would currently sell for between $30,000 and $40,000 in the present market. Thankfully, there are other routes to get a taste of the legend, and we were able to acquire two amps for testing in the video. As I said in the introduction, this short history is going to focus a little more on playing and listening than most listening to a couple of amps that come directly from the train wreck lineage. With Brad Paisley's love for AC30s and the chime they generate, it may now seem inevitable that the Paisley would go looking for the tones of a train wreck Liverpool. But by that point, Fisher wasn't well enough to build many amps. And also by that point, Paisley was working with Dr. Z, and he encouraged Z and Fisher to collaborate on an amp design together. This would become the Z-Rec. Similar to a Liverpool, but specifically designed to run as a cleaner platform, it was a design collaboration between Dr. Z and Fisher, shipping amps back and forth, collecting Fisher's input on endless faxes as Fisher didn't use a computer. I'll admit that the original silver and dark wood Z-Rec amps have haunted my sleep for years. My friend Zach Broyles from Mythos Pedals gave in to that desire a few years ago and bought one, planning to use it for gigging. 
but he found it was way too loud for anywhere that he could gig in a bar these days, and that, to get into those tones that he wanted, you had to exceed the sort of stage volumes allowed. So for those looking for an edge of breakup tone, and not in an arena like Mr. Paisley, the full z rec would certainly be a challenge. But that all changed this year when Dr. Z just released a z rec Jr., a version at half the wattage and with a master volume. Now before you start throwing yellow flags on these features, let me remind you that I mentioned earlier that the first Liverpool prototype was a 15 watt amp, and Fisher published multiple master volume designs over the years, though he never implemented one of them in his own amps. He did include them in mods for many famous clients. These are not as anathema to the train wreck ethos as they might first appear. The Junior has a classic post-phase inverter master volume to tame things to usable levels for multiple venues. An aircraft aluminum chassis with the shortest possible wire runs and a layout that optimizes the separation between the signal and the power carrying sections of the amp. I spoke briefly with Dave Hunter who reviewed the amp for Guitar Player Magazine last summer. He was very impressed and said so in the article which is linked in the description. So much so that it led Guitar Player Magazine to award a product of the year to the Z-Rec Jr. for 2020. Dr. Z kindly lent us a Z-Rec Jr. head for Jeff to demo here, so I'll take a break and let the amp pick up some of the story. Jeff is playing straight into the front of the amp, which is then running into a Universal Audio Ox box in deference to Jeff's New York Metro neighbors. that you heard at the top of the video, and will again at the outro, was a Comet Arrow 33. My script editor, Perry McManus, was putting a lot of pressure on me to do the Trainwreck history, and when I mentioned I was looking into it to Jeff McElane, Jeff put me in touch with his longtime friend Holger Nutzel, one of the owner-designers at Comet Amps. Holger was one of the few people that Ken Fisher regularly spoke with on the phone. Nutzel moved from Germany to the States over 25 years ago, but even before that happened, he was in touch with Fisher by phone. His love for vintage amps, and particularly the tones that Fisher was chasing, had led him to reach out to Fisher by phone, and Ken was generous with his time and advice. Nozel and his business partner at Comet, Mike Kennedy, worked with Fisher to design one of their most popular amps, the Comet 60. They started working with Fisher because they were already predisposed to his way of thinking about amplifier design, and so over time, they've internalized much of the design aesthetic that Fisher had developed. The Aero 33 we have here is something along the lines of a train wreck Liverpool. But Holger patiently explained that this is the way the amp sounds, not specifically in the way the circuit is designed. He said that there's a difference between topology and components. The topology is the specific schematic and layout of the amp, but this is only part of the story. There are also the components and component values, and finally, there's the assembly of the parts in three dimensions in the chassis. This last part, having the experience necessary to build an amp that can dance on the edge of control to serve that level of dynamic simplicity is the reason that Fisher believed no one else could really build a train wreck. Holger illustrated this for me with a story. They'd been working with Fisher on one of the amp designs on which they'd collaborated. The amp had made the trip back and forth between Comet and Louisiana and train wreck in New Jersey a couple of times already at this point in the process and the guys at Comet were playing the amp for Ken over the telephone. After listening for a couple of minutes, Ken said, uh, I think the screen resistor is the wrong value. You should change it back. And he was right. <laughs> now he'd listened to that amp many times, and he knew the design well, but to hear the difference in a single part over the telephone? Well, that's how genius stories can get started. Jeff is playing the Aero 33 through the same rig he did as the Zurich Jr. The guitar right into the front of the amp, and then into the Oxbox to handle the volume concerns there in New York. Again, 
I'll let Jeff Plang do the story. partner with Truefire because I've used them for over a decade and my playing always improves when I put in the time on their lessons. Whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or professional level player, Truefire has lessons to inspire and advance your playing. As you know, I always promote spending money on lessons before new gear. I really like Truefire and I think if you give them a shot, you'll like them too. You can get 25% off courses using the promo code 5 watt 25 or like I have for many years, sign up for the All Access Pass to use the entire Truefire catalog. You can sample anything in the catalog with the All Access Pass and see where the Muse takes you. I love their tagline, Learn, Practice, and Play with Truefire. I'd like to thank Truefire for partnering with me and sponsoring this video. I'll leave you with one final story. In the process of writing this short history, John Mark put me in touch with Michael Klockuk, an amp tech and builder from Indiana. I spoke with Michael on the phone about his friendship with Ken. Like so many other young folks of the era, he was swept up in the immense change in guitar sounds after the success of the early Van Halen albums, and so Maiko began searching for ways to achieve that rarefied tone. He read a magazine article that this guy Fisher had worked on some of Eddie's amps, so he became determined to get in contact with him. As it happened, Maiko's mom worked for the phone company, and so he begged her to get the phone number of Kramer and Fisher out in New Jersey. She did. And so Maiko cold-called Fisher, the first time being when he was only about 13 years old, armed with a mountain of questions. As the saying goes, fortune favors the bold. And Michael told me for years he would talk with Ken on the phone or write letters back and forth, and Ken would always answer and would steer him to learning more about amps. When Michael was 16, Ken called, and not really knowing how old Michael was, he asked, are you still in school? Michael replied that he was, and Ken responded, I don't want you to drop out or anything, but could you go to night school and stuff and be finished with your high school degree by next September? Michael paused and said, maybe, why? To which Ken replied that he'd recommended Michael to be the guitar and amp tech for Joe Perry on the next Aerosmith tour, and the tour started next September. <laughs> Michael scrambled and finished his degree, met the band, and got the gig. The phrase may go, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery but I'm not sure that really measures up when it comes to getting the gig teching for one of the biggest rock bands to ever exist. After his passing, Ken left a set of transformers and a hand-drawn schematic for Maiko so that he could build his own Trainwreck Express with parts pre-selected by Ken. Maiko told me that those transformers are still sitting in the closet, but that he'll be ready to build that amp someday. I hope the short history of Trainwreck amps, and particularly the playing examples we've given extra space to here, leaves you knowing more about the amps that remain some of the most sought after in the world. Given the timelines for the videos, shipping at the holidays, etc., I had to have the amps shipped directly to Jeff in Brooklyn, bypassing a stop with me in Ithaca. 
Given everything I've learned about the amps, and given that I'm actively trying to have less gear, I'm pretty confident that it worked out for the best, because I may not have wanted to send one back. If I missed something, or if you have your own train wreck story to share, please put it in the comments for everyone to enjoy. First, I need to thank the ever-extraordinary Jeff McElane. To show what these amps can do takes a player that can play cleanly and with exceptional dynamics. Jeff is the only player I could think of. Along that line, I'd like to thank the guys at Two Rock Amplifiers for lending us their endorsed artists for this short history video. If you want to learn to play like Jeff, check out Jeff's courses on Truefire. I need to thank George Dyer for his article, Trainwreck Amps, that's posted on Reverb. I need to thank Dave Hunter for his article, The Last Trainwreck, for Vintage Guitar Magazine, and for his recent review of the Dr. Z Z-Rec Jr. for Guitar Player Magazine. The links to the articles are in the description. I'd like to thank the guys at Premier Guitar for the use of the clip from 2012 of Jeff playing the Trainwreck amps at Ultrasound Studios in New York. The link to that full video is also in the description. I need to thank Holger Notzel from Comet Amps for spending so much time on the phone with me, sharing his memories of his friend and mentor, Ken Fisher. I need to thank Dr. Z himself, Mike Zadie, for speaking with me to outline the collaboration with Fisher that led to the Z-Rec and ultimately to the Z-Rec Jr. I need to thank John Mark, JM, longtime tester and now builder at Trainwreck Amps. No one spent more hours with Fisher while he was building the amps than John did, and his association with the Fisher family keeps these designs alive and available. He was generous with his time with me on the phone and shared many memories of his good friend Ken. I need to thank Michael Klockuk for sharing his early memories of Ken Fisher as a friend to a young amp builder. It's a great story and says a lot about the generosity of Ken Fisher. And this is where I usually thank my script editor, Perry McManus, for cleaning up another jumbled script. In addition to that thank you, I'll just add that this video was wholly his idea, so I hope we've done it justice. I need to thank all of you that have stopped by the store to buy a t-shirt, hoodie, or the Stomp preset pack. And in particular, I need to thank the friends of 5 Watt for their continued support of everything we do here at 5 Watt World. You guys are the best. If you enjoyed this short history of the Trainwreck Amps, hit the like button. And if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and hit that too. Thanks for watching. Until next time, thanks for being a part of the 5-Watt World.